Hello again, everyone. Dr. Vincent Lau coming at you from uh, Western University Critical Care Program again with Dr. Robert Arnfield on a co-authored point of care ultrasound hemodynamics series. We've been delving into uh, advanced hemodynamics in regards to valvular lesions over the past couple cases, and this one is no different. We'll be looking at primarily right-sided disease uh, with uh, RVSP, pulmonary hypertension, corpora banale, and RV overload in case number seven of this hemodynamic series. So again, as a primer, please check out the westernsano.ca website for Dr. Arnfeld's stroke volume determination how-to before delving further into this hemodynamic series. So we begin with the case of a gentleman admitted with hypoxemic respiratory failure secondary to sepsis from a rhinovirus causing ARDS. Uh, he's transferred from a peripheral ICU to a tertiary care center with BiPAP on board. Uh, he's hypotensive initially, and despite being treated with uh, IV fluids of two liters of uh, Rainer's lactate, he has a, a decrease in his blood pressure after these boluses. It's apparent why this uh, response occurs because he uh, has underlying scleroderma on HOMO2 for severe pulmonary hypertension with an RVSP estimated at 70 to 90 millimeters of mercury in a previous echo. Uh, he also has an LVF of low normal of 50% and he has moderate to severe RV dysfunction from pulmonary hypertension. He is unfortunately not a lung transplant candidate as he would need an on-block heart and lung transplant uh, for which he's been denied this previously. His blood pressure is 102 or 56 on norepinephrine 5 mics per min heart rate 103, uh, sinus tachycardia, rest rate 24, SATs 95 on a BiPAP, EPAP of 12, uh, IPAP of 19, and FiO2 75% and he's afebrile otherwise. His medications include a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, Tadalafil, 40 milligrams per day, and Remodulin at 12 nanograms per kilogram, uh, as well as a late 6, 20 PO daily. He was previously being treated for his ARDS and pneumonia, with piptazo and levofloxacin, but those have since been stopped after the rhinovirus uh, came back positive and no other cultures were positive. Otherwise, his labs are only significant for a white count of 16, bilateral patchy infiltrates in keeping with ARDS, significant right bottom branch block and RBH on EKG, and he is hypoxic with a PO2 of only 52 despite the BiPAP settings listed there. So again, as the 54-year-old gentleman with uh, worsening hypoxemic respiratory failure, secondary to rhinovirus and ARDS, uh, given that we know that he has severe pulmonary hypertension and moderate to severe RV dysfunction, uh, we were hesitant uh, through our ICO consultant to intubate and uh, cause a positive pressure ventilation, which would make uh, pulmonary hypertension worse. Uh, we had no inhaled nitric again because the patient was not intubated and Folan was not available at our center so the remodulin as well as the Tadalafil and other afterload reduction agents for the RV were the only things available to us. So he's brought to ICU, central line was started and norepinephrine presser a 5 max per min was initiated to maintain a systolic blood pressure of 100 over 50. Despite this, uh, ARDS uh, continued to worsen with ongoing hypoxia uh, with SATs lowering down into the low 90s despite the initial BiPAP settings as mentioned before. So again, the POCUS questions asked to the sonographer at the bedside was ongoing shock uh, with hypoxia despite uh, norepinephrine of 5 mics per min and the patient had already received 2 liters of fluid. But given that we know that the patient has uh, RV dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension, which is severe, was the IV fluids the right choice? Uh, was uh, further pressors or inotropes required for the RV failure at this time? A volume assessment was sought after as well, given that the patient has ARDS and to see whether or not um, diuresis would be a positive uh, thing for this patient given that uh, uh, it was a concomitant sepsis, possible cardiogenic and obstructive shock all in the same patient. So looking at the images, so having a look at the lungs, the patient has a uh, significant beeline burden seen throughout the lung fields uh, in keeping with the known rhinovirus and ARDS. The beeline pattern goes all the way up into the pleural line and radiates all the way down, indicating that the lung is up and that there's no pneumothoraces and there's still sliding lung as seen here. And we see that the patient does not have any pleural effusions to note no consolidation at the bases and there's uh, a curtain sign uh, over top of the diaphragm here. And again, this is repeated on the right hand side as well. So getting to the 2D images themselves, we see an LV uh, systolic function, which is normal to possibly even hyperdynamic with the LV cavity uh, obliterating in systole. We see a pericardial fusion, which is preferentially around the ventricles, which is small. We see there's no significant MR when we throw color across the mitral valve, and the aortic valve seems to open well, indicating likely not significant aortic stenosis. 
and we throw color across the aortic valve as well and we show that there's no significant uh, aortic regurgitation either. Getting to our peristernal short axis view, again we see the pericardial effusion, uh, small in nature, and we see a normal uh, left ventricular function, but more importantly we see a significant D-shaped septum indicating both pressure as well as volume overload in systole and diastole uh, in this patient. Looking at the subcostal images, we see a pericardial effusion, which is small again, a normal left ventricular function. The right ventricle looks like there's a mild systolic dysfunction and a very large right atrium. And we see here an IVC, which is plethoric in nature, no respiratory variation, in keeping with high right-sided pressures. And that can be seen measured out here at 2.80 to 2.89 centimeters for a plethoric distended IVC. Again, we see here the uh, pericardial fusion around the ventricles. When we play the clip, we see that the right ventricle is actually much larger than the left ventricle in terms of size, so it's dilated, uh, probably severely so, and the systolic function is mildly depressed on this uh, right ventricular free wall, which we'll see with TAPSI. And getting to a modified RV inflow view, we see here primarily this is the right atrium with the coronary sinus coming in here. This is the right ventricle with the tricuspid valve and we see what looks like to be severe tricuspid regurgitation through the tricuspid valve. So we know that in terms of RV and LV size we can qualitatively assess the RV that the normal size should be two-thirds lat of the LV but in this case the RV is greater than the LV uh, in this patient, so uh, in keeping with severe dilatation of the RV. And in terms of our short axis, which we saw before, the normal uh, LV cavity should be round uh, throughout the cardiac cycle, but in our patient, there's significant uh, septal flattening in keeping with a D-shaped septum. And this is, uh, again, uh, noted here for RV pressure overload, which is most evident in systole, and RV volume overload, which is most evident in diastole. Clinically, this is of minimal utility, however, it's uh, interesting to note. So we see here in our apical four-chamber view a more straight shot through the tricuspid regurgitation uh, in order to estimate uh, pulmonary hypertension, and we get a peak uh, gradient of 92.5 millimeters of mercury uh, with a very dense envelope seen here. And again, as mentioned before, we can do a M mode through the tricuspid valve annulus and get a TAPSI, uh, a tricuspid annular planar systolic excursion, uh, which measures out to be 1.48 centimeters, which is less than 1.6 centimeters in keeping with uh, systolic dysfunction of the right ventricle. In order to calculate our stroke volume and cardiac output, we grab the LVOT diameter at 1.92 centimeters. And we see here with our VTI uh, at the LVOT level with a pulse wave Doppler, we get a VTI of 11 centimeters. Plugging that into our cardiac output formula, we get a stroke volume with a VTI of 11 centimeters, a uh, LVOT diameter of 1.92, and we get a stroke volume calculated out at 31.8 cc's per beat, which is quite low. And again, multiplying that by heart rate, our stroke volume, uh, and our cardiac output comes out to 3.3 liters per minute. So a formal echo was ordered to confirm our findings, and again, we see a severely dilated right ventricle. Uh, in fact, they said a moderate leads to severely reduced systolic dysfunction, uh, which was worse than the mild we had seen, seen before. A severe TR, uh, severe pulmonary hypertension uh, with uh, RBSP greater than 90 millimeters of mercury, uh, normal left ventricular function and small in size compared to the RV, and significant pressure overload with a D-shaped septum, septal flattening uh, of the right ventricle. And the pericardial fusion that was seen had no uh, echocardiographic features of tamponade. So again, what can we optimize in our patient? The patient has uh, hypotension, which is being maintained on norepinephrine five mics per minute, uh, and severe pulmonary hypertension has been treated by uh, tadafinil as well as remodulin for uh, RV afterload reduction. But is there anything else we can optimize in this patient? For the stroke volume, we know that the patient's volume overloaded given the D-shaped septum, IVC being uh, plethoric, and uh, B-lines throughout the lung fields. Um, so there's a possibility that uh, we could uh, add on diuretics to try to see whether or not we can decrease the amount of RV overload and improve uh, flow through the pulmonary vasculature to the LV and thereby increase our stroke volume to the left side. 
in terms of our contractility, the patient already has a normal systolic function on the left, uh, but is there a role for adding on uh, inotropic agents for the right side and RV failure in this setting? And there could be definitely a role for that. In terms of uh, chronotropy, we should not add on any uh, further chronotropic agents given that the patient already has a heart rate of 100 and is tachycardic. So our recommended actions at this time were to diurese with Lasix given that the patient had B-lines, IVC was full, and RV overload with D-shaped septum. We had said to uh, maintain the current level of vasopressors, norepinephrine 5 mics per min uh, at first, and uh, to continue the remodulin for RV afterload reduction for pulmonary hypertension, which was severe. We were unable to add on milrinone at this time given the patient's low uh, BP and our fear of inodilation, and dobutamine uh, was not added for the same reason, as well as for tachycardia that could be induced in this patient further. So post-diuresis, we see that the D-shaped septum has gotten much better and the LV is still preserved. Uh, the pericardial fusion has seemed to subside uh, post-Lasix and the IVC looks to have some uh, respiratory aeration now and it's come down to normal size. And that's seen here in M mode as well at uh, 2.22 uh, to 2.30 um, centimeters. So again, here post diuresis, we do a calculation of the regurgitation through the tricuspid valve, and we see our pulmonary hypertension has come down from a systolic of 90 down to a systolic of uh, 46.2 uh, post diuresis. And we see here in our LVOT, uh, we do a pulse wave across to calculate our VTI for our stroke volume. And our stroke volume has gone up from 11 to 20 and uh, has significantly improved post diuresis. So our stroke volume has increased for, uh, to 57.9 cc's per beat. And subsequently as well, our cardiac output has increased to 5.96 liters per minute. So again, a good end to this case for this gentleman with that ARDS rhinovirus septic shock and uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure. Um, he had obstructive shock also uh, with diuresis responding well with increased stroke volume, decreased D-shaped septum, and uh, overall improved hemodynamics uh, from the uh, septum bowing into the LV. He was eventually weaned off his uh, norepinephrine and weaned off BiPAP onto five liters nasal prongs. He continued to have a uh, decrease uh, RV uh, afterload and pulmonary hypertension with an increase in his remodulin and he improved overall with his RVSP numbers coming down from 90 to 50 to 60 millimeters of mercury. So overall good end to the case and very important hemodynamic findings guiding management. So thank you once again for joining us for another POCUS hemodynamic series. Uh, please check out the westernsono.ca website for screencasts on stroke volume determination. And we hope to see you guys again in the future. Thank you very much and have a nice day.